But I want to start out by introducing you to the true experts in what a properly formulated low carbohydrate or, and or ketogenic diet is. And these are our experts. These are two Inuit women on the Canadian North Slope, the Arctic coast in summertime. Um, and these people know more about how to actually, you know, the right foods in the right proportions to allow people to, um, you know, women to give birth and people to grow up and to have a healthy lifestyle. Um, we don't have, you know, precise medical records on these people. We knew, do know that some Inuit lived in to, to be 70 or 80 years old because when they were interviewed in the 1940s, they could remember things that happened at the end of the last century. Um, so it was not a death-dealing diet. It wasn't a diet that, you know, everybody died before they were age 30. Um, the thing that, that we don't have, of course, is not only do we not have medical records in terms of longevity, they were not a literate culture, and they did not write down exactly what they ate. Um, and so we don't know uh, precisely from their writings, from their records, what, when, they, when they slaughtered an animal, what things they saved for themselves and what things they fed their dogs and what things they threw away. Uh, if you look at the garbage dumps around the places where they had their campsites, you can see you know, they ate, they, you know, there were this many seals and this many uh, walruses and this much whale. And sometimes when times were tough, they ate their dogs. Um, but you don't know what part of that that they, they ate and which part they, they threw away. So, not belaboring the point, there were some people who lived among the Inuit and wrote down things from their experience. So here's a, 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 a pastel drawing that was um, uh, taken from the diary of a very interesting Arctic explorer, a US Army surgeon named Frederick Swatka. And he wanted to find out what happened to the Royal Navy Franklin expedition. Sent expeditions into the Arctic, and the largest one ever sent into the Arctic to find the Northwest Passage was a two-ship a two ship expedition headed by uh, Sir John Franklin. He had 129 men on these two ships. Uh, they were provisioned for about five years in terms of, you know, typical Navy food, which is, you know, salt, meat, and biscuit. Um, and... They sailed into the Arctic in 1843. They were seen, last seen by a whaler in 1844, and then no trace of them after that. Um, and it became a major quest in the mid to late 1800s to figure out what happened to them, and particularly to find the ship's logs, the other written records, to determine the fate of these 129 men. Um, and even by uh, 1878 or 1880, um, uh, uh, it was known from interaction, interaction with some of the Inuit who lived in that region, who traveled outside there, that the ships were trapped in the ice and, most, and, and the men died trying to drag their boats across the ice, trying to get to open water uh, to get uh, um, uh, out from there. But no one had found their records. So Swatka um, decided rather than going to the Arctic with all his food and all his provisions and a big phalanx of men and you know, sleds and horses or whatever, he said, why don't we just hire a couple of Inuit families and have them take us there? And so that's what they did. They hired two Inuit families. There were uh, four um, European origin, four Caucasians in the party. They left western, the west coast of Hudson Bay um, uh, in 1879, or early winter of 1879, and traveled for uh, uh, 13 months, covered 3,000 nautical miles, and all of them came back alive. They got all the way up to the uh, out into the islands in the Canadian Arctic to King William Land, where the ships came to grief. They found skeletons, they found abandoned boats, they found lots of materials. They didn't find the ships, no men alive, uh, and they didn't find the records. This was a, a remarkable journey in which these four guys adopted the Inuit method of travel, adopted the Inuit diet. They started out with just one month's food supply. They were gone for 13 months, so obviously, um, after the first month, they were living uh, on the diet that the, the native people lived on which indicates that it's not a genetic capability, that the genes of these people and the genes of these, pe these people weren't different, uh, that they could all live and survive on the same diet. He wrote in his diary, when first thrown wholly upon the diet of reindeer meat, by which he means caribou, it seems inadequately to pro inadequate to properly nourish the system, and there is an apparent weakness and inability to perform severe exertive fatiguing journeys. But this soon passes away in the course of two to three weeks. It, what he's saying is you can't make a transition from a high-carb diet to a low-carb ketogenic diet overnight. You can't make that transition in a week. And yet most of the studies up until 
uh, when I first came to this topic, most of the studies that have been done comparing low-carb and high-carb diets, particularly as they're related to physical performance, were all less than two weeks duration. And some of them were even one week less reduction in, in or, or duration of the diet. And they say, well, low-carb diets always cause people to be debilitated, so they've got to be bad, you can't do this. There was, again, this, this remarkable Arctic explorer, his name is Stefansson, first name is unpronounceable, my best rendition is Wilhelmjör. Um, he was of Icelandic origin, but born in Canada, grew up in uh, the north central states in the United States, and then went to Harvard to study what they called in those days comparative religions, which was really anthropology. He was fascinated by the Inuit, and after completing his studies at Harvard, he went into the Arctic, and over a 12-year period of time, he lived among the Inuit. He learned to speak their language, he wore their clothes, he learned how to hunt the way they did. Um, the only things that he had different was he carried matches, and he had paper and he wrote things down, and he had a, a clock and a sextant so he could navigate by the stars. He learned how to build their snow houses, and he became very adept at their lifestyle. In fact, he became kind of passionate about their lifestyle, and when he came back to civilization, well, what we call civilization, he wrote about it both in, in the lay literature and in, in uh, uh, professional articles, but that was the time when nutrition was a nascent field and we were just discovering all the 12 vitamins, right? That happened between 1914 and 1926. And right in this period of time, in the late 19-teens and early 1920s, he's saying, I could live on a diet of meat and fat, I ate no vegetables for up to a year at a time, and I didn't get sick. And he was called a liar. I mean, he was vilified in both the popular press and the, and the professional press, uh, to the point that in order to salvage his reputation, he would, allowed himself to be locked up in a, in a hospital for a year where he only ate meat and fat. And the goal of the people who did, ran the experiment, it was called the Stefansson uh, experiment, uh, the goal of the experiment was to prove that he would get sick, that he would develop scurvy within four months. Stefansson ate this diet for a year and showed no signs of scurvy. So they, to the credit of the scientists who ran the study, they published the data. And they kept very accurate records of what and how much Stefansson ate. And you can see he ate 115 grams of protein a day average, which is only about 15 up to maybe 20% of his daily protein requirements. So first myth that, we, that we, we can discard here, a low carbohydrate diet as eaten by Aboriginal people, and we have data, data from other cultures as well, is not a high protein diet. It's a very modest protein diet. The shocking number for most people who have been taught to fear fat is that close to 80% of his calories per day came from fat. Now, he wasn't eating seal and whale and, and caribou in New York City, because this research hospital was in New York City, but he was eating market meats, and he was allowed to choose of what he wanted, and he ate a lot of lamb. He ate most of his meat boiled. The Inuit either ate their meat frozen, and then when it thawed, they ate it raw, or it's kind of like uh, you know, meat sashimi, and uh, otherwise they, they boiled their meat, and they not only eat, ate the boiled meat, but they drank the broth. During my medical training, I developed a passion for riding bicycles, and I would ride my bicycle if I could find a mountain, I'd try to ride over it just to see if I could. And I learned that if I ate a, a diet that was rich in carbohydrates, and I ate carbohydrates during the ride, I could ride for hours and hours and hours and be fine. If I didn't eat carbohydrates during the ride, if I rode for more than an hour and a half or two hours, I would suddenly, kind of my energy would drop off, and that's called hitting the wall. Uh, and it's common among endurance athletes that if they don't eat enough carbs before and, and, and if it's a long event, during the event, you run out of energy and you know, your performance collapses. So we had this, I had a discussion with some of my, my senior colleagues when I was in training about, you know, well, if people go on this Atkins diet uh, and they're not eating carbs, it has to impair their performance, right? Uh, but some of the people who'd been on, the patients who'd been on the diet had kind of told us that, it doesn't seem to bother me. I've, I've been on this for months and my performance is fine. So we designed a project, initially just with untrained people, uh, not, not with athletes, where um, we lured them into being locked up in the metabolic ward in the hospital, kind of a diet prison for seven weeks by saying, you're gonna lose a lot of weight. Uh, and for the first week, we kept them on a maintenance diet and tested their physical capabilities on the treadmill. And then after they'd been on the, the maintenance diet for a week, we switched them to not an Inuit diet, which is high in fat, but a moderate protein, very low carbohydrate, relatively low fat diet. It was about six or 700 calories per day. And the average person over six weeks lost 25 pounds. And we tested them three times during this, this uh, six week period of time on the low carb diet. Uh, just before they started, 
after one week on the diet, which is typical of many of the, the previous comparative studies, and then after six weeks on the diet. But after six weeks, the average person has lost 25 pounds. It wouldn't be fair to test their performance on the treadmill because they're so much lighter. So as you can see, we had them wear a backpack that we stuffed with heavy objects and made them carry all the weight they lost, which caused them to complain bitterly. But they put up with us. Nobody dropped out. And we asked them to exercise each time as long as they could until they reached exhaustion. And these are the data of what we found. At baseline, which is here, they went just a little short of three hours. Now, for an untrained person who doesn't habitually exercise to walk for three hours on a treadmill is actually quite a remarkable performance. And then after uh, one week on the diet, they went for a little, just a touch over two hours. So we, they, we cut their performance by about a third, just by taking away the carbs. And this is precisely what the Scandinavians who developed the concept of carbohydrate loading, what they reported in uh, papers in the 1960s. Um, and so this was very consistent with those data. If we'd stopped there, my career would have been a lot easier because I would have agreed with them. But we made the mistake of carrying it out to six weeks. And now remember, they're carrying a backpack, and they went a little over four hours. And our response was, uh-oh, because Robert Atkins published his first diet book in 1972. This is the late 1970s. And we realized we've just validated this guy who is considered a quack. In this case, we took the... Um, the, the, the idea that rather than have people lose weight, we take people who are highly trained athletes already who knew from their personal racing experience what exhaustion felt like. So we, we recruited five lean, healthy bike racers, and this time we fed them basically the diet of Stefansson, 15% protein, over 80% fat. The only carbohydrates they got was actually the glycogen, that is the stored carbohydrate in the, mu in the muscle, in the meat of the animals that we were feeding them. We fed them chicken, tuna, or beef uh, as their entrees. Um, and because we were limited in resources, uh, we only kept them in the metabolic ward for four weeks of the low-carb diet. And we did a baseline uh, a performance test at baseline and then at the end of four weeks. And we poked a lot of holes in them to get a lot of samples from them. I won't bore you with all those, those data. Uh, it wasn't an easy study to do for them, and we were just absolutely gratified that of the five people we recruited, they all finished out the project. And this is kind of numerically dense data, I apologize. But let me just point out, first... We measured something called VO2 max, which is their peak aerobic power. This is the highest rate at which their bodies could consume oxygen and use it to turn fuel into energy. This, the mark of a highly trained athlete is they have a very high VO2 max. And this number of 5.1 liters at baseline is a very, very uh, respectable, if not excellent number in terms of physical training. Four weeks of no carbohydrates in their diet. Now, they continued to do their training, by the way. The typical training for these guys was 100 to 200 miles a week, so it'd be 150 to 300 kilometers of riding per week. After four weeks of continuing their training and withdrawing virtually all the carbohydrates, they, there was no significant change in their peak aerobic power. Peak aerobic power does not, is not dependent on dietary carbs. Their endurance time to exhaustion went from 100, 147 minutes to 151, so this is four minutes more here, and that is not, not a significant difference. What did change dramatically was this is a measure of the glycogen in their muscle. We actually took a needle and took a piece of muscle out before exercise and it poked the needle in after exercise and took some more muscle out and checked how much glycogen they had. This is the primary source of carbohydrate for these guys, for the muscle during exercise. And they dropped from 143 units to 56 units, which is, they, they, their use was 87 units of glycogen. I won't get into what those units mean, but this is 87 here after Four weeks of the low-carb diet. First, notice, we fed them no carbohydrates for four weeks. They continued riding uh, 200 to 300, 150 to 300 kilometers a week, and yet they still had considerable muscle glycogen. Their glycogen didn't go to zero, even though the dietary carbohydrate intra intake was virtually zero. So their bodies had become very uh, skilled at preserving glycogen. And so when they did the final exercise test, they only used 23 units, and they did the same duration and the same intensity. So they were able to cut their rate of glyco muscle glycogen use by more than threefold and, do, and still do the same amount of work. This violates everything that's still written in all the textbooks of physiology, which say the amount of glycogen you use is strictly dependent on how much exercise you, you, you do. And then the other test that we did was we measured the 
with a face mask how much oxygen they consumed and how much CO2 they produced. And that we, from that, we calculate something called the respiratory quotient. And from that so-called RQ, you can measure how much of the total body fuel they're using, not just glycogen, is how much is fat and how much is carbohydrate. And 0.83 represents about a 50-50 mixture of carbohydrate and fat. And that's very typical for a highly trained athlete at about 60 to 65% of their peak aerobic power. After four weeks of the low-carb diet, this dropped to 0.72, and that means they're burning over 90% of their calories from fat. And that kind of number had never been seen and never been published in the literature. And we published it, and it sat there. <laughs> and as Professor Noak said, there's this cognitive dissonance that you could have the data in plain sight, but if people don't want to believe it, it's just ignored. This is the time to exhaustion for the five separate athletes. The red line here is the mean value, the average of all five. But notice that one of them went up a lot, this one went up a little bit, this one went up, or this one went up quite a bit, this one went up a little bit, and these two went down, which means we're not all white lab rats. We are heterogeneous as humans, and our responses are different. So there are two interpretations we could take from this, and that is a low-carb ketogenic diet is great for this guy, good for this guy, pretty good for this guy, and terrible for these two guys. Or the other interpretation is that we only gave them four weeks to adapt. And maybe some people do well in four weeks of adaptation, and some people need eight weeks. And what I can tell you from our experience with abs athletes subsequent to that is many athletes tell them to, to really fine-tune the low-carb diet and get the benefits, and oftentimes greater benefits on this than on a high-carb diet. They have to be on the diet for two or three months. So duration of adaptation becomes important. But the key thing here is that humans don't switch from a high-carb diet to being able to optimally utilize a high-fat diet overnight. And you certainly can't do it mid-race as an athlete. You have to adopt this as a lifestyle and use it for a significant duration of time if it's going to uh, be useful to you. But there was a study published. Now, remember, we published those data back in the early 1980s. There was a, pub stated, a study published in 2005 by a group from the Netherlands. And they did a study where they took 300 people. Some of them were obese and untrained. Some of them were highly trained athletes. But a whole cross-section of the population, 300 people, and measured the peak rates at which their bodies could burn fat. That is, when you put them on a treadmill and increase the exercise from stage to stage to stage, how much fat, what was the highest rate that anybody could burn fat? And of 300 people, the highest they found was 60 grams of fat per hour. And the average was half that, about 30 grams of fat per hour. And in this paper, they said the highest rate at which a human can burn fat during exercise is 60 grams an hour. That, and this is, this is still the standard accepted data. So my friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Volek, who I really wish was here, but his day job got in the way of, he went back and took my dissertation, my thesis numbers from that bike racer study, and he calculated them in grams of fat per hour. Of the five bike racers, the lowest was 74, the highest was 112, and the average was 90. He said, Steve, there's really something important here. And he just took my sterile data and put it in reference to what is published in the textbooks and said, this diet has the capability of change, dramatically changing how athletes can use fat. Some kind of pioneering athletes have adopted this, not as a short-term strategy, but as a lifestyle. And this is a picture, it's kind of hard to see, but this is a, you can see a pretty lean looking guy who's still upright. He's just run 100 miles over the Sierra Mountains, from the east side of the Sierras to the west side of the Sierras, on, not on roads, but on mountain trails. It's called the Western States Endurance Run. Um, and uh, his name is, is um, Timothy Olson. Uh, he's had been a very good runner before he went to low carb, but in the latter stages of these long races, he suffered what many ultra runners experience, which is nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And the reason, part of the reason for that is, is you can't store enough energy in your body as carbohydrate, as glycogen, to run 100 miles. And the rule of thumb for this race in the past has always been, if you don't eat at least 6,000 calories of carbohydrates, you don't make it to the finish line. But Having to, I don't know how many of you run and have tried to eat when running, but it, it's kind of a, a major um, problem for the body to go up and down like this and digest at the same time. And they get a lot of GI problems. But if you 
train their bodies to burn fat at double the rate. They have to eat much less carbohydrate. And so Tim Olson had adopted the low-carb diet about eight months before he, he ran this race. Here he's winning it. You see there's some kind of light on his side here. This is, that's, a, that's the last daylight of that day. And this is the first time that any runner finished this race in daylight. He took 21 minutes off the all-time course record, uh, doing it on low carb. And it really got the attention of the ultra running community. But a lot of skeptics said it was a fluke or somebody gave him a ride on a, on a trail bike or something like that. So the next year, Tim came back and won it again. <laughs>